morning, church, again. Today's teaching text comes from Malachi chapter 1, and I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. It reads as follows, a pronouncement. The word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you ask, how have you loved us? Wasn't Esau Jacob's brother? This is the Lord's declaration. Even so, I loved Jacob, but I hated Esau. I turned his mountains into a wasteland and gave his inheritance to the desert jackals. Though Edom says, we have been devastated, but we will rebuild the ruins. The Lord of armies says this, they may build, but I will demolish. They will be called a wicked country and the people the Lord has cursed forever. Your own eyes will see this and you yourselves will say, the Lord is great even beyond the borders of Israel. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. But if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is your fear of me, says the Lord of armies, to you priests who despise my name? Yet you ask, how have we despised your name? By presenting defiled food on my altar. How have we defiled you, you ask, when you say the Lord's table is contemptible? When you present a blind animal for sacrifice, is it not wrong? And when you present a lame or sick animal, is it not wrong? Bring it to your governor. Would he be pleased with you or show you favor, asks the Lord of armies. And now plead for God's favor. Will he be gracious to us since this has come from your hands? Will he show any of you favor, asks the Lord of armies. I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would no longer kindle a useless fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of armies, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations, from the rising of the sun to its setting. Incense and pure offerings will be presented in my name in every place, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of armies. But you are profaning it when you say, the Lord's table is defiled, and its product, its food, is contemptible. You also say, look, what a nuisance, and you scorn it, says the Lord of armies. You bring stolen, lame, or sick animals. You bring this as an offering. Am I to accept that from your hands? Asked the Lord. The deceiver, the deceiver is cursed. The deceiver is cursed who has acceptable meal in his flock and makes a vow, but sacrifices a defective animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of armies, and my name will be feared among the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, church. We are a gospel-centered church, as you would have heard Francois speak about earlier. And we believe that God speaks to us through the word. We therefore believe in teaching all of the Bible, giving a balanced diet to equip everyone with the understanding of God's word. The Bible consists, consists of 66 books in two parts. 39 of the 66 books belongs to the Old Testament with 27 books in the New Testament. This morning we start with a new series, or we start in a new series in the Old Testament. When you look at an overview of the Old Testament, you will find five sections. The Pentateuch, which is directly translated as the law. The law of Moses, which is God giving Moses his law for the people. So the first five books, Genesis to Deuteronomy, are all part of the law, the law section of the Old Testament. The next section is the history, which includes 12 books from Joshua Judges to Nehemiah and Esther. So it's a wide number of books, 12 books. The, the history section is about Israel as a nation, the rise and fall of different kings. We learn about kings like David and Solomon. And Israel rejecting and following God in different seasons. We see them face the consequences of whether they reject or embrace Jesus. Wisdom and Poetry is the third section, which includes five books. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. The last two sections are, 
are category, categorically called the prophets, so minor and major prophets. So you'll see on the slide just the breakdown of those books or the sections that contained in the Old Testament. So the prophets, pre- the prophets were God's mouthpiece. Prophets would predict the future and warn people about what God is telling them. And the dangers maybe of also not listening to God. So we know that we can trust these prophets. We can trust God because Jesus is risen as we witnessed during the resurrection last week. Everything that he said is true and can be trusted because of that resurrection. This morning, we're going to look at Malachi. Don't worry, I won't ask for hands to see who has read it, because we'll work through it together. This is one of the shorter books of the minor prophets. Um, Minor prophets only minor because they wrote smaller books of the, the Old Testament, major primarily because they wrote the larger books. So Malachi was written 400 years B.C., before Christ. Malachi was the last prophet God used to speak before Jesus Christ. So this is a picture of a movie, um, The Blind Side. This movie tells the story of Michael Orr, a homeless and traumatized boy who is portrayed to have no hope or prospects of a future. He is taken in by Leanne Tohoy, who is played by Sandra Bullock um, and her family. The Tohoys offer Michael unconditional love, support, and acceptance, ultimately changing his life for the better in the midst of challenges and difficulties. See, he doesn't know them does not trust them. He has been indoctrinated into the situation that he is in. However, he becomes part of their family, ultimately accepted and loved by other children within the family. Michael is given all rights and privileges of sonship. He then protects the family and loves the family. So we see unconditional love being the reason for changing Michael's life as he's accepted, seen, and loved by the family. This morning we look at chapter 1 of Malachi. We will be reminded about God's free, unconditional, sovereign love for the Israelites. God's chosen people. We will be reminded that we too form part of God's chosen people because God adopts us, gives us rights and privileges of sonship. God loves us and if we understand that love, there should be a change in how we live and how and we ought to honor God. Three points this morning. God's love for Israel, Israel's idolatry and unfaithfulness, and God will be honored. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, this morning as we come before you, we pray that you would help us to hear your voice, that we would hear the Holy Spirit speak to us. I pray that you would remove all distractions that lay before and ahead of us and that we'd be able to focus and to hear you. As we learn and see and grapple with the book of Malachi, I pray that you will build a hunger in us for you. I pray that we would see and enjoy and embrace the love of God, a love that is like no other. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Malachi is written 100 years after the Israelites returned from Babylonian, so you'll see a picture of the gospel, uh, the, the Bible project behind me. Um, returned from Babylonian exile to a people living in Jerusalem. So the temple in Jerusalem was rebuilt as encouraged by Haggai and Zechariah, two other minor prophets in the Old Testament. So Haggai and Zechariah indicate the completion of the temple as a moment that will bring about peace, bring prosperity, and the conversion of people from other nations and the return of God's own glorious presence at the completion of the temple. After the completed rebuild of the temple through books Ezra and Nehemiah from the history section of the Old Testament, we see that things aren't going very well. 
even after the rebuilding of the temple. The people in Malachi are discouraged. They face economic difficulties. They aren't seeing the conversion of people from other nations as they think and as they prophesied would happen. The Israelites remain or see themselves as insignificant, no longer an independent nation and facing continuous spiritual decline. What we will see in Malachi is that God is not pleased when we are not obedient or when we don't follow his commands. Those that don't follow his commands will face separation from God. We will learn that God sees the heart. We can't hide from him. God will return. We know this is true because we know that God does not lie. We experienced the resurrection last week. Jesus said it would happen and it did. The resurrection is a fulfillment of prophecy. So then we know that God will return because he said he would. When he returns, he will judge. During the series, we will see that God desires for us to return to him. Be obedient and honor him. God is speaking in 47 of the 55 verses in this whole book. Malachi writes in a disputational or debate form of poetry. God, through Malachi, brings a claim to the people. The people disagree or question the claim that God brings with a response, which sometimes starts with the word, but you say, or yet you say. So they question the claim that God brings. Then God, through Malachi, replies to the people's response as a final response for each claim. So there are six claims in this book, six disagreements between God and the Israelites. So let's look at the first point, which is the first claim and disagreement. This week and next week, we'll focus on the claims that can be themed as exposing Israel's corruption. And the last two weeks, we'll see claims themed around confronting the corruption. The first claim, and our first point, God's love for Israel. The first claim is seen in verse 5 of chapter 1. Verse 1 starts with the words pronouncement. Other translations say oracle or prophecy or burden. So God gives the prophet a weighty message to deliver. It is a burden also because not everyone who hears these words from God through the prophet will accept the words. Some will reject the words of God through the prophet. As a teacher of God's word, I have to carry the burden of faithfully delivering God's word. It is weighty. While working through the word of God, it has to do a work in my heart, in my mind, before I'm able to faithfully deliver it. Sometimes, even as teachers, we deliver the word of God, and we know that not everyone will accept it. God gives this this burden, God gives this pronouncement to Malachi so that he can deliver this word to Israel. Just a quick side road. Malachi was writing to the Israelites. So how does this message then apply to us if it was written to the Israelites? That's a great question. God's chosen people are the Israelites. Through Abraham, many nations will become part of God's chosen people. This is the promise of God to Abraham. Abraham is blessed and so will all nations through Abraham. Abraham's blessing finds its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ, who is part of the lineage of the family tree of Abraham. If we remember that family tree, we will see David and Jesse, son of David, in Isaiah 11 as well, which forms part of that family. So anyone who comes to Jesus in repentance and faith forms part of this family, forms part of the family of Jesus, forms part of the family of Abraham, and forms part of the promise of blessing from God. In Jesus, anyone can be forgiven and receive the Holy Spirit and justification in Christ. Galatians 3 verse 29 says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We too become part of God's chosen people if we have put our faith and trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. So if we are Christians, then this book is written for us and to us. In some ways, we are similar and act like the Israelites, and we will see that as we grapple with the book. Also, if we're not Christians, then this book is for us, to hear the love of God for his people, to hear the impending judgment that is coming if we don't act on that love, if we don't draw near to him. 
if we don't put our trust in him. The hope is that if you don't know God, that you would see and know the love of God for you, repent and believe in him. So firstly, in Malachi, seen in verses 2 to 5, the Lord declares that he has loved his chosen people. The Israelites' response is shown with the words, how have you loved us? What would be your answer to that question, fam, if you had to answer it? How would you describe God's love in your life? If your family life has challenges of conflict, ill health, financial difficulties, and lack of spiritual progress, how would you describe God's love in your life? Would you then be doubtful of God's love like the Israelites? Would you also be asking how God has loved you? If you experience abuse, hurt, and pain, if you experience disappointment, failure, and rejection, would you have concern about God's love for you? The answer to the question, how have you loved us, is in verses 2b to 5. But it seems like a hard one to understand. See, the answer includes Esau, Jacob, Edom, and a question. Why would God give that answer, including asking if Esau is Jacob's brother? The Israelites would have known the answer to these questions. So let's build out the context to understand the answer that God gives. The answer, I believe, has to do with a picture or definition of love. Esau and Jacob are brothers. In fact, they are twins. The Bible says they struggle together in the womb, and this is a future indication of their relationship. Esau was the elder of the two brothers and would therefore have all the rights and blessings as heir of the father's inheritance. Esau would then be heir to the covenant between God and Abraham as the firstborn. Even though Esau was the elder brother, God chose Jacob and the descendants of Jacob as his people. The Israelites form part of the lineage of Jacob and God chose Jacob instead of choosing Esau, who was the elder brother. This is, the, this is the essence of the doctrine of election, church. The doctrine of election states that God chooses who he would save, and God's choice comes before anything we can do, before our faith or lack of faith, before our attempt to do right. And I'm using the word attempt because it would only be an attempt, because without God we can do no right. God chose Jacob before time. It doesn't have anything to do with Esau or Jacob doing anything wrong or right. I know that the doctrine of election can seem unfair, but the truth is we are all sinners at birth. No one ever teaches a child to disobey and choose to do things their own way. If we are left to our own choices, we would not choose God. We would all rebel against God and his sovereignty. Sovereignty meaning supreme power and authority. We would rebel against the authority of God. If we are to turn to God, if we are to repent and be filled with faith, God must intervene. God must initiate it. John 6 verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. So without election, without God acting, we are destined to face the wrath of God. We are cursed. The doctrine of election shows the love of God in the face of our rejection and rebellion towards God. He chooses to save us, to show grace and mercy. Ephesians 2 verse 7 to 9, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. Here's a quote from a Puritan named Il Nathan Pam. This doctrine affords comfort. Thy unworthiness may dismay thee, but remember that thy election depends not upon thy worthiness, but upon the will of God. Election depends not upon thy worthiness, but the, upon the will of God. The answer God gives to however I loved you includes a question as well. So we see Malachi 1 verse 2b, even so I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. Because God is a God of love, 1 John 4 verse 8 says, The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. Because God is a God of love, can God then hate Esau? 
No, the use of the question about loving Jacob and hating Esau is not related to the emotion of love and hate. Let's look at Romans 9, verse 10 to 13. Rebecca conceived children through one man, our father Isaac. For through her sons, for though her sons had not been born yet or done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to election might stand. Not from works, but for the one who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. So Rebecca had two sons, twins, Jacob and Esau. We've already mentioned this. God chose Jacob to be the father of the Israelites, his chosen people, instead of Esau. Esau becomes the father of the Edomite nation. And we'll see the Edomites mentioned in, in the first five verses of, of Malachi. The Edomites were blessed by God. If we look at Genesis 39, uh, 33 and, and 36, they were blessed by God. So look again at Romans 9 verse 10 that we just read. We see that the words or concept of love and hate have to do with God choosing one man, Jacob, and the descendants, the descendants of that man while rejecting another man, rather than act, actual words of emotion, of love and hate. So Malachi speaks about Edom building, but God demolishing speaks about Edom being cursed. Years after Jacob and Esau died, the Israelites and the Edomites have become enemies. The Edomites received the blessing of God and had what they needed. So they were blessed. Their curses we see in Malachi and in the Bible story comes from God's blessing on Israel. God blesses Israel in Genesis 27 verse 29. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. So the Edomites were blessed. But it says the Edomites build, but God demolishes. And this is because the Edomites being cursed, because they attack and partner with other nations to curse and destroy Israel. So God choosing Jacob was God's election and choice and does not have to do with the emotions of love and hate for Esau. It has to do with God's choosing to bless one man and to reject another. We all face moments of doubt and uncertainty about God's love for us, but this is what we should remember when we do. The response that God gives through Malachi to the question, how have you loved us? God's love for us is seen as in, in his choosing to love us. Think of someone belittling you, calling themselves better than you, insulting you, maybe even spitting at your face when you try to help them. Would you respond back in love? God responds back with his electing love. God chooses us even though we reject him. His love is free. Free because we don't even have the right currency to pay for it. We are bankrupt and can't pay for it. God's love is free. It's a gift. His love is unconditional. His love is his choice and he chooses you and me. And his love is supernatural because in choosing us, he sends Christ to take our place on the cross. Sends Christ to bear separation from him in our place. To die in our place and to quench or satisfy his wrath in order to fix the broken relationship between us and God. For Christ, the separation was only momentary because he is God. He conquered death and now sits on the right hand of God. For those, don't know, for those who don't know God, the separation will be eternal. Would you give your child to save someone else? That's what God does. The gospel, here's a quote from Tim Keller. The gospel says you are simultaneously more sinful and flawed than you ever dared believe, yet more loved and accepted than you ever dared hope. We just witnessed that, resurrect, that, that supernatural power, that love when we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus last week. We witnessed it. This love should be a love that both overwhelms us with joy, but causes a tremble in the sovereignty of election. It should overwhelm us because if we know Jesus as Lord, that God has chosen us. God has loved us even though we reject him from birth. 
the trembling and sovereignty should come over us because not everyone is chosen. So some people you know, either in your workplace, in your gym, in your social club, or your family may be rejected. We don't know who God chooses. We can't tell from your badge or the clothes you wear or the shoes you wear. What we know is that not everyone is chosen, but you are if you have repented and put your faith and trust in Jesus because of what Jesus has done in calling you to himself. So why does this letter start this way? Why does the letter of Mark start with the love of God as the first claim? I think verse 5 lets us into the reason why. Malachi 1 verse 5, Your own eyes will see this, and you yourselves will say, The Lord is great even beyond the borders of Israel. The Lord is great even beyond the borders of Israel. You yourselves will know that the Lord is great. Everything that comes next comes with the context that God loves us and comes with the knowledge and truth that God is great. Knowing and proclaiming that the Lord is great should be the response to his love. The response to his love for us. Beyond the borders of Israel means not only those who are his people will come to know the Lord is great. Even those who are the descendants of Edom who, who were rejected. Those from all nations will know that the Lord is great. When the Lord returns. For some who have put their faith and trust in him will rejoice. And others who don't know him will face his wrath. But all will bow their knee and know and affirm that the Lord is great. The fitting response to remembering and experiencing the love of God is obedience and worship. Worship is how we live. Let's see how the Israelites live. Our second point, Israel's idolatry and unfaithfulness. In this poetic way of writing, we've gone through the first claim, disagreement and response. God loving Israel, Israel asking how, and God showing the majesty and sovereignty of his love. So the second claim is found in verse 6 to 14 of chapter 1. A son honors his father and a servant is ma- his master. But if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is your fear of me? Says the Lord of armies to you priests who despise my name. Yet you ask, how have we despised your name? So the second claim and this agreement starts with a metaphor of human relationships with sons and fathers, masters and servants. In this metaphor, God is the father and the master. Then the question from God is, if I am a father, where is your honor? And if I am a master, where is your fear? The response to the claim of not honoring or fearing God as father or master from the Israelites is to question how they are despising the name of God. Last part of verse 6. The context of Malachi sets the scene, the scene for this claim. The temple is rebuilt, even though the temple has been unsatisfactorily rebuilt, because it does not look like the Old Testament. Um, the Israelites grapple with this and they grumble at this because they're unhappy that it doesn't look like the Old Testament. And we see this in the book of Haggai, which we did a series in last year. So this is the place the Israelites would bring their sacrifices to God, this temple, and present it, the sacrifice to the priests, who would then take care of the ceremonial rites for the sacrifice. So knowing what is expected when bringing sacrifices, the Israelites would bring sacrifices that don't show honor, to God, but contempt to God. Just a couple of observations from this section, from verse 6 to 14. So priests are identified as a disobedient or not showing honor to God. In context, priests would bring and offer up sacrifices to God on behalf of the people in, that are coming to the temple. Individuals would bring sacrifices as atonement for their transgression. God does single out priests in this text as part of of the people who are not bringing honor to himself. It's important to mention that it's not only the priests, even those bringing the sacrifices to God are singled out for not bringing the right sacrifices because they know what the right sacrifices are. If we're reading this today, it is easy to check out because you don't have to bring livestock to atone for your sins. We don't have an altar where we sacrifice livestock. So then what does this passage look like in this day and age? What does bring, bringing our sacrifice, which is dishonoring to God, look like in this day and age? It looks like filling up your day with all sorts of good activities like work, family, gym, socializing, and then rushing through the last five minutes before bed trying to read the Bible or praying. This is bringing an inadequate offering before God and not enabling you to grapple with the Word of God and know who God is. 
It looks like spending more time on social media, reading the news, studying, but finding no time to hear from God through the, the Bible. None of these things I mentioned are bad in and of themselves until they take the place of God over our lives. It looks like not honoring the supremacy of Christ, of Christ and living for and continuing in practices that involve the ancestors or ancestral worship. God is supreme and all-powerful. Any ancestral practice or worship is dishonoring to a living God trying to serve dead people in his place. It looks like storing up treasures on earth which can include decisions on where we stay, what we drive, how we use our money, and waiting till all the money spent in your account to see if there's anything that should go to God. It looks like elevating idols to the place and position of God in our lives, being controlled by the approval of others, being controlled by, your, by that addiction of social media, or enticed by the things of the world that move you away from God, from being in spaces where you are learning more and knowing who God is. It looks like starting or joining that Sunday club, starting that business or choosing that activity which takes you away from attending church. Our relationship with God is not based on the number of times we attend church, but based on your position in Christ. The question that matters most is not how many church services you attended. What matters is, did you truly know Jesus? Here's the thing, you will meet and encounter Jesus as the body of Christ gathers together. How do you know if you're a disciple of Jesus? You love God and love people. If you're not going to church or going to spending time with God's people, can you really say that you love God and love people? Are you encountering Jesus? Are you being transformed by him? Are there other things that are more important in your life than Jesus? If we have things that are continually taking us away from God and God's people, we need to make sure this isn't giving half-hearted worship to God. It looks like living without Jesus at the center of our lives, living without honoring God as Father. Verse 1 says, God says, I have loved you. This is in the past tense. So understanding the greatness and majesty of God is remembering his faithfulness at all times, that he has been faithful and continues to be faithful and will continue to be faithful. It is having the love of God being the mirror in which we see our actions as either nothing or everything. The Lord of Armies is another repeated word or theme. So we see Lord of Armies mentioned a couple of times. The Lord of Armies shows the authority of God in being able to lead armies. It shows the power of God that he could command his armies to act at his word. Other translations use the phrase Lord of Hosts, which, which is a similar word and relies on the idea of armies and angels, so both natural and supernatural. So it speaks about the power of God over the natural and supernatural. This speaks about the sovereignty and the majesty of God, the Lord, Lord of armies. He doesn't need us to do anything. God doesn't need, us to have to, doesn't need to have us honor him for him to be great. He's already great. Malachi 1 verse 10, I wish one of you would shut the temple door so that you would no longer kindle a useless fire on my altar. I'm not pleased with you says the Lord of armies, and I will accept no offering from your hands. God would rather not have the hard-hearted and self-seeking or self-glorifying sacrifices. What we should see from verses 7 to 14 is the idolatry and unfaithfulness and self-seeking response from the Israelites to God. They have forgotten or clearly not understood the love of God which they have already experienced and continue to experience. They experienced the love of God and faithfulness of God many times as God had kept them, protected and provided for them. Most recently, they returned from exile and this newly rebuilt temple, but they still don't honor God. There's also a warning that we see in Malachi 1 verse 14. The deceiver is, is cursed, who has an acceptable male in his flock and makes a vow but sacrifices a defective animal to the Lord. If we don't respond to God as Father and honor Him, if we don't put God first, Malachi 1 verse 14 says, we will be cursed. 
This is a warning to us also. If God is not first in our lives, if he doesn't take priority, if our lives are not a reflection of his love, then we may be deceived and then ultimately cursed. Because when he returns, he will say, get away from me, evildoer, for I do not know you. Our last point, God will be honored. Jesus is the perfect lamb, the one time perfect sacrifice for cleansing all of our sin. Jesus fixes our relationship with God, giving us direct access to the Father. Jesus is a picture and representation of God's love for us. We can always look back to the Israelites and see the hand of God over their lives and into our lives as part of God's chosen people. He chooses from birth. He loves us. Verse 11 and verse 14 is part of the main response to the claim, where is my honor? Because God asks, where is my honor? Malachi 1 verse 11 says, My name will be great among the nations, from the rising of the sun to its setting. Incense and pure offerings will be presented in my name in every place, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of armies. Not only for the Israelites, but all nations will know God, will know who God is. This is also my name will be great. So this is present but still continuous and coming. There is coming a day when the name of the Lord will be honored when he returns. From the rising of the the set to the setting, sun refers to past and present, referring to one day, the ultimate setting, which will have the return of Jesus. If we know that God loves us, should we not then honor him? If we know that God loves us, and God has chosen us, should we then not honor him? Malachi 1 verse 14b says, For I am a great king, says the Lord of armies, and my name will be feared among the nations. The Lord of the universe, the Lord of the armies, the great king will be feared because of his name. To fear God means genuine reverence and respect for the Lord, to realize God's greatness and sovereignty. When we fear God, we acknowledge he is holy and worthy of all praise. There are two responses. Two responses to what Malachi is saying if we read it and grapple with it. One of fear and reverence to the Lord, which leads to obeying God, naturally wanting to keep his commands, wanting to honor God. This is a natural response for Christians who feel the Holy Spirit may be tugging at the heart springs and calling them to obey There should be no other greater or more important thing than God in our lives. So he should come first before everything. The way we live should also encourage or build up those around us to seek to know God more. The wrong response to this message, to the love of God or or honor God, would be guilt. That we're not honoring God. Through Jesus, we are forgiven of our sins, including idolatry, including our half-hearted response to honoring God. In view of the mercy of God, seen in his love, we should give our lives as a living sacrifice. We should come back to the heart of worship, which is all about Jesus. We should come back to the heart of worship, which is all about Jesus. So the first response is one of fear and reverence to the Lord, obeying God and wanting to keep his commands. Second response is wanting to know this God who loves freely, unconditionally, and supernaturally. A God who sent his son for you. Tim Keller says, the only love that won't disappoint you is one that can't change, that can't be lost, that is not based on the ups and downs of life or how well you live. It is something that not even death can take away from you. God's love is the only thing like that. If you're wanting to know this God who loves, he wants to know you and has chosen you. In a moment, I'm going to pray a specific prayer, and I'm going to ask that you repeat after me if you want to know this God, if you don't know this God. You can just pray this prayer quietly in your heart, and I believe and trust that God would be moving and at work as we pray this prayer.
Church, as we get ready to close, can I ask that we all stand as a sign of honor as we spend a few moments of prayer? Let's bow our heads, church. If you want to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, then repeat after me quietly in your heart and in your mind. Heavenly and merciful Father, I stand before you humbled and sorrowful, aware of my sin and rebellion and desire to do life my own way and ready to repent. Lord, thank you for opening my heart and mind to my need for repentance and forgiveness. Lord, forgive me for I have sinned before you. Cleanse me of all my sin and help me to turn from sin. Build a fear in me for you. Lead me to walk in your way, leaving behind my old life and starting a new life in you. Let's continue in, in, church, in prayer, church fam. So if you were the first response, one of fear and reverence for the Lord, I hope that this prayer would be part of your prayer quietly in your heart as I pray as we close. Lord, create a fear and reverence in our hearts for yourself. Where we stray and where we may feel guilt, we know that it's not from you. For we know that the Holy Spirit would not bring guilt, but would bring restoration and would bring and draw us closer to yourself. I pray, Lord, that where there are things in our lives that are moving us further away from you, where there may be idolatry, where there may be unfaithfulness, that you may show those areas to us. And that you would enable us to bow the knee and to repent and to receive your forgiveness. Help us, Lord, to continuously put our faith and trust in you. We thank you that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. And that brings us life. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.